Perfect. Thanks so much. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for having us here today. We're really excited for the opportunity to chat with all of you. Um, my name is Fiona McLeod, and I am the Manager of Clinical Support and Capacity Development with the Primary Care Team at First Nations Health Authority. Um, I'm joining you today from the beautiful traditional territory of the Silk Nation in what is now known as Kelowna, where I live as uh, an uninvited guest. And I will pass it over to Tatiana to, to introduce herself. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tatiana. I'm the uh, Acting Manager for Primary Care for the Vancouver Coastal Region at FNHA. And I'm calling in today from the beautiful and the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Perfect. Thanks, Tatiana. And uh, so we're, we're going to dig right in. We're, we're uh, going to chat with you about the, the First Nations-led primary health care initiative today. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, Tatiana. Um, I just wanted to quickly touch on the two big acronyms that we're going to be um, using today. And we'll, we'll probably go back and forth between expanding them out and using the acronym itself. The first one is FNPCI. Um, and this is the First Nations-led primary health care initiative. And we use this acronym when we're referring to the entire initiative as a whole. And the second one is FNPCC, and that stands for First Nations Primary Care Center or Centers. And we use that one when we're referring to individual sites within the FNPCI. So next slide, please. I'm gonna guess that everybody's pretty familiar with the information on this slide, given our, given our audience here. So I'll try not to spend too much time but uh, as, as a quick overview, in 2018, 2019, the Ministry of Health launched a transformational team-based primary care strategy to increase patient attachment and access to quality, comprehensive, culturally safe, and person-centered primary care services across the province, which is quite the mouthful. Um, team-based primary care is now being delivered using a number of models. Uh, we've lift, listed a few examples here. Um, and just acknowledging too that while a lot of these are, are, are successfully up and running, there's still lots uh, that's under development and, and will be for definitely several years to come. So these clinical service models and all primary care providers in a defined ge geography are of course aligned together in primary care networks, uh, which is a huge reason why everybody's here gathered today. Um, and Tatiana, if you could just click once more. Um, Today, we're going to look specifically at First Nations primary care centers that are being developed under the First Nations, um, First Nations led primary health care initiative. So, next slide, please. This is just a little bit of a, a visual look at, uh, at, at what we're talking about. And so, positioning this within the PCN landscape, um, it looks something like this. And, Tatiana, if you click once more, we should have an animation there too. Yep. So the First Nations Primary Care Center uh, is part of the local area primary care network. However, as we'll see in the slides, following the service design, planning, implementation, governance, and operations of a First Nations Primary Care Center happens through a different process from that of the PCN planning process. And I really want to highlight that the development of an FNPCC is not meant to replace um, First Nations as partners in the development of, of the broader um, PCN and other elements of, of primary care systems transformation. And as well, I also want to emphasize that although the design and planning process is, is separate for an FNPCC, the goal is absolutely not to create a parallel system. FNPCCs are an, are an initiative that will be connected into the PCN. So next slide, please. What is the First Nations-led primary health care initiative? Um, it's, it's a lot of things, but uh, as an overview, we're going to start with the, these few things here. So first of all, it's, it's a partnership between the Ministry of Health and the First Nations Health Authority. It's a shared commitment between FNHA and Ministry of Health to advance the Decla Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, the recommendations of Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen Trapel Lafon's In Plain Sight report, and the recommendations that came out of both the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as well as the, the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. As we saw in an earlier slide, FNPCI is also a component of the Ministry of Health's overall primary care strategy. And overall, it will result in up to 15 
First Nations primary care centers whose design, planning, decision making, and operations are led by First Nations. Um, these sites are, are also going to be a combination of, of net new sites and scaling up of existing services. Next slide, please. Little bit of historical background of the FNPCI, and these are really key pieces as to um, sort of how we got to, to where we are today. So firstly, the challenges of accessing culturally safe care are exacerbated by social inequities, colonialism, and intergenerational trauma that are that's experienced by Indigenous people and their families and, and communities. So the attention to the provision of culturally safe and trauma-informed care are essential to the service pathways as, as they're developed and to primary care in the province of BC as it goes through transformation. If you haven't yet had the chance to read either the full or the summary in plain sight report from Mary, Ann, Mary Ellen Terpel Lafond um, from November of 2020, definitely highly recommend at least having a scan through it as it provides a lot of really concrete examples about how these ongoing impacts are continuing to play out to this day for indigenous people who are accessing um, healthcare services in the province of BC. So, you know, sometimes, sometimes we read some of the information that's out there and it's like, okay, I know this is here, but what does it actually look like? And that report actually helps us to really understand, um, you know, from, from, a, from a practitioner standpoint, standpoint um, what First Nations people are actually experiencing using concrete examples. So um, really important piece of, um, a really important resource for us as practitioners. Second, the province of BC's mandate to innovatively transform the primary care system through the planning and implementation of new primary care service models presents an opportunity to build relationships founded on the practice of reconciliation, indigenous self-determination, and the right to participate in decision-making, as well as to work in collaboration to embed cultural safety, humility, trauma-informed care throughout the health system. So one second, I'm just gonna rejig my uh, screen a little bit here. That's better, okay. Um, and lastly, um, the FNHA along with the ministry has been working to transform the way healthcare is delivered to First Nations and Indigenous people through direct services. Um, so, sorry, through direct services, funding, partnerships, collaboration, and healthcare systems innovation. In keeping with this, the First Nations led primary healthcare initiative was established in 2019 as a partnership between the Ministry of Health and First Nations Health Authority to co fund and develop up to 15 First Nations primary care centers across the province. If it's done well, the First Nations primary care centers will be tangible representations of reconciliation and self determination throughout our province. The FNPCCs do follow policy directives and established parameters, um, and it's also recognized that First Nations are the decision makers of First Nations primary care center planning, development, implementation, and operationalization, and that like-minded partnerships are required to dismantle barriers and create opportunities that accommodate First Nations needs and decisions. Next slide, please. So the following are some core aspects of the FNPCI and the FNPCCs. So, so first, the First Nations primary health care centers, sorry, the First Nations primary care centers are led by First Nations. And this is really a keystone aspect of both the FN, each FNPCC as well as the FNPCI uh, as a whole. So this means that the governance, decision-making, planning, implementation, health information management and ongoing operations of FNPCC services is led by First Nations. FNPCCs provide access to culturally safe, quality primary health care services for First Nations people and their families. And you're going to see some similarities here between um, some of the principles that are, that are being followed in PCN development and, and the FNPCCs as well. So just acknowledging that too, that um, you know, this isn't necessarily uh, separate um, from some of the principles that have been set out for the PCNs, but we feel it's just really important to highlight um, as some of these core aspects. Um, so, so this one around culturally safe quality primary healthcare services means clients will feel safe, welcomed, valued, respected, and heard when they access care services at an FNPCC. Indigenous ways of knowing and being 
are the foundation of the FNPCC service models. And this is going to mean different things for different sites as we look at different, um, different traditions, different culture, um, different ceremony at different sites. So elders, sacred knowledge keepers, and traditional wellness practitioners are key members of the, the primary health care team and work in close collaboration with Western medicine practitioners. FNPCCs use team-based models of care. So, so guided by the self-determined care needs of the client, both in-person and virtual primary care services are provided by a team of traditional and, well, and, and Western caregivers in a collaborative and relational environment. And then last we have here, FNPCCs will help to bring primary, care, primary health care services closer to home for First Nations people and their families in BC. So for those living in rural and remote communities, which probably all of you are very familiar with, um, this means addressing barriers to access and providing culturally safe and quality primary health care services in or nearby their communities. Next slide, please. Just touch on service models here. I'm not going to go into to great depth, but I think it's important just to give you a bit of an idea of um, sort of the next level of detail. So as mentioned in the last slide, the FNPCCs will see different types of healthcare providers working together in the same space. The services are going to look different at each site, as I also mentioned, um, because local healthcare needs, as well as culture, ceremony, tradition, are taken into consideration in the, in the service design and in the practitioner mix that's, um, that's going to be at each clinic. Examples of some of the services that the FNPCCs might choose to offer include traditional healing and wellness, mental health counseling, nursing services, family practice physicians, harm reduction support, social work, elder supports, and, and lots more. There's, there's a couple of uh, sites that are looking at you know, physio and occupational therapy. Um, next slide, please. And here I'm gonna pass it over to Tatiana for a couple of slides. Thanks for that, Fiona. Um, so here we just wanted to share with you a little bit more on how we're actually helping First Nations communities to um, implement this at, at a practical level. Um, so at FNHA, we are divided into uh, different regional teams as per uh, the health authority. So like I mentioned during my introduction, I work for the Vancouver Coastal Regional Team. Um, so that means that I am supporting the implementation of these primary care centers in the Vancouver coastal region. So normally we would have um, a primary care manager and a primary care project manager that would be working very closely um, with First Nations communities to um, outline the process that has to be followed and to support the um, planning, design, and implementation of these primary care centers. Um, so what does that concretely look like? Um, so community engagement is a key component of uh, the FMPCIs. Um, as the name implies, it is meant to be First Nations led. So that means that we want to be really careful to gather opinions, feedback, of um, First Nations community leaders really get their perspective on what they would like to see on, their, on the ground in terms of primary care for their communities and work together with them to, to actually um, incorporate that in the design of um, primary care centers. Um, so we basically organize um, regular meetings with key community um, people, for example, that could be a health director, that could be a chief, um, key people from uh, different First Nations communities that are going to be heavily involved in this process, in the process of creating the primary care center. And we also organized um, larger community engagement events um, that are meant for the First Nations communities that are going to be um, benefiting, I guess, from the primary care center. Um, we also organize uh, engagement events for our partners. So um, that would depend on, on the different locations. But for example, that might include, for example, sharing information on PCNs or CSC tables. Or that could also include organizing a session um, with local healthcare providers to gather their perspective on um, 
what do they think about the primary care center that is being designed. So um, there's quite some flexibility there, but I guess the key message is that community engagement is um, absolutely important for the success of the First Nations-led primary care centers. And um, here, I just wanted to go a little bit more in detail um, into the work that has been done for the Vancouver Coastal Region, because again, I can only speak to that. Um, but in our region, we have uh, three primary care centers um, that are either implemented or in the process of. So we have Luma Medical Center, which was, um, it's in, in East Vancouver, and it was actually the very first FMPCI site in all of the province. It was the pilot project and it was uh, launched in fall 2019. It was very successful. And uh, thanks to that, both the Ministry of Health and the FNHA decided to move forward and provide funding for 14 other First Nations-led primary care centers. Um, we will also have a similar primary care center for New Hulk Nation. Um, so that will um, be in Bella Coola. Um, and with them, we're just at the very beginning phases. So we're at the phase where we're creating a document that would be something similar to an expression of interest. So just at that information gathering phase. And then we will have one in the Southern Stadium region. And with them, we're a little bit further ahead. So we're at the phase where we actually yesterday had a community engagement event with um, the chiefs and council leaders of the different nations involved to hear their feedback on what they would like to see in their primary care center. And it was really wonderful to hear um, the excitement of these First Nations communities to um, participate in the design of this primary care center and to hear their um, ideas and hopes for what they would like to see there. Um, so at this point we have um, a, two, a very short two minute video of Luma that um, we were hoping to share with all of you, but maybe I'll just look to Leanne to see if, um, how we're doing with time. Okay, so I need to stop sharing for a sec and open that up. Hey, Tatiana, I think we're missing the sound. Oh. Sometimes what happens is when you share your screen, it gives you the option to share audio as well. Hmm. You might just have to unshare and share again. I think what I'll do is maybe because of my screens. Thanks for jumping in, Fiona. I wasn't sure if it was a quiet part. <laughs> I think I'm having technical difficulties here. Fiona, is there a way that you could um, try to open that up? So, Tatiana, when I was trying to share this morning a playlist, mm -hmm. I noticed that uh, when, when I'm opening up the share to click share, mm -hmm. there's a bottom little tick, tick box button in the bottom left-hand corner. So if you're mm -hmm. already sharing, it's too late. So if you just stop the share and then reshare your screen, there's a little um, tick box in the bottom left-hand corner that says share audio. I don't have that. I just get one participant can share the time. Multiple participants can share. Oh, advanced sharing options, maybe. Uh, no, you're in. You're in too deep. So if you stop sharing, oh. mm -hmm. um, and then do it as if you've just started from the very beginning, this exact same thing happened to me this morning. Mm -hmm. Um. Sorry, Jen, I'm cutting your grass here with tech support, but I just, I'm relating. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. Um, how about now? Maybe let's try. Is that working now?
No? No, I don't think so. Do, uh, do you want to try sending me your slide deck? Um, it's it's a video, actually. It's not... Um, or, a, yeah, a link? Um, let's try this one. So it says host has disabled participant sharing, which I thought I was the host. So I think you have to make me the host again. Tatiana. Oh, okay. Um, Isn't this fun, everybody? How do I go ahead? A little bit of theme music. So if you uh, check, check the little um, box on top of the right-hand corner of my picture is a little dot, 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 and you can make me the host. Um, So there's a button to mute me and then three little dots. And if you click on the square that says dot, 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 there should be a drop down that says make host. Yes, okay. Now we're cooking with gas. Alrighty. So I'm gonna share sound. The lovely Josh Gregan taught me that this morning. And is it the teaser or the MP4 file? Yes, the teaser. Teaser. Being a safe person to go to and actually creating an environment where somebody can feel a sense of trust coming in with a, any sort of health care concern, any, any health complaint, and not fearing you know, um, judgment or um, retribution or, or ill treatment, um, that makes a huge difference. So many of our, of our um, you know, our family members, um, you know, Indigenous people in this country fear going to see the doctor, fear going to the hospital, fear going to the emergency room because of the way they're going to be treated. You walk into the space normally and it's, there's kids running around, you hear drumming in the back, there's people singing, it's just this, this beautiful chaotic space and it's, but it's a space of healing, like there, there is calmness and stillness in it as well and it's, uh, it's just an environment where I think most of us feel comfortable and if you're an Indigenous person walking in, um, you, you just, you feel it in the walls, like the space is like, okay, this is a space for me. There are things that are clinical, so we can live with that, but know this and understand this, that we are traditional people. We will go back to the age old ways our people did things in the past and base it on the four seasons, base it on this, on the sacred powers, the sacred elements of the fire, of the earth, of the water, of the air. That is who we are. When they reach, the doctors and the nurses reach the kind of like the end of the line with the patients that come here and they're kind of like lost, and kind of like given up. They send them in to us and we say to them, there's always hope. There's always hope. for your support with that, Leanne. And thank you everybody for uh, your attention. That's what we wanted to share with you today um, regarding the FMPCIs and uh, we're happy to take your questions. Okay, I don't see uh, any hands jumping up. So I'll just remind people that uh, the bottom sort of toolbar, you have a reactions tab and you can put up your hand. Oh, there, Bev, thank you for demonstrating that. <laughs> You've got a question for the presenters. I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Fiona. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a question. So the PCN work that's uh, occurring in communities, and um, you said that that they're to complement one another. How are they actually, like, like what's the envisionment of that sort of connection between the PCNs and the PCIs just in terms of the work that we're doing? Because we're gonna start that pretty soon in, in, uh, in the Lillooet in particular. And so I'd like to sort of know how they're sort of complementing one another and how we're sort of connecting. Yeah, great question. I'm, I'm gonna take 
a bit of a stab at this and, and I'm going to stay pretty high level because this can look really different um, depending on, on, on where things are, are kind of happening. Um, but, but sort of as an overview and, and Tatiana, please add to this, um, both are working directly with the ministry and the primary care di division of the ministry. So all of those discussions around um, sort of attachment gap calculations um, and, and what services are going to be offered are, are sort of, um, those, those conversations are happening in, in collaboration with, with the ministry. In terms of what it looks like sort of how the, the, the First Nations Primary Care Center, like this, they might have a steering committee or they might have a working group, like the, the, the structures that are doing the planning might look a little bit different from site to site in terms of how they're connecting in with the local um, collaborative steering committees or, or PCN steering, um, steering committees, sorry, collaborative steering, collaborative steering committee, CSC. Anyway, the CSC or the, or the PCN steering committees um, might, might look a little different from, from site to site. Anything to add, Tatiana, from, from your point of view? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can add a little bit um, to that specific question. Again, just highlighting that it does depend from side to side, but for Lilliwatt, for example, um, they, so the two health directors of the two First Nations health organizations that are involved in the um, FNBCI, they are active participants of uh, the CSC uh, of Pemberton. So um, they are quite involved there. And then for the FMPCI itself, um, so like I mentioned, we're at the, at the community engagement and feedback gathering phase. So based on that, um, a service plan will be developed. So once we're at that phase where we can share a little bit more information, there will be um, a community engagement session organized um, for the PCN so that um, we can share more in detail and broad information on what concretely um, would that primary care center look like. And I guess that would be um, an interesting uh, conversation to have um, with the goal that, so the idea is that um, given that both have limited resources, the FMPCI and the CECs, we want to maximize those resources, right? So that's why it's important that that dialogue is taking place so that um, we can, join our forces and sort of make sure that um, resources are invested um, in the best way possible. Great, thank you, Fiona and Tatiana. And I'll just jump in. We played acronym bingo at our board uh, orientation <laughs> yesterday. And so I think what, I'm not joking, it was super fun, um, collaborative services committee. Um, I actually got a couple of the acronyms wrong in the bingo game, which just like added to the hilarity of the whole thing. Um, I think the <laughs> next hand up is uh, Brooke and then Greg, over to you, Brooke. Um, thank you uh, so much for your presentation. I um, I live over on the west coast of Vancouver Island, um, uh, and, and known as Nachucks or Tofino. And so we are in the process of implementing um, the service planning as a partner um, for the PCI, but we're also really rolling down the road of PCN. And wondering of um, like facing some community urgent needs, has there been successes in the other PCIs for an early draw? And uh, I'm wondering what your experience is with that based on community desire and need and how quickly that can um, happen. Again, I can, I can speak a little bit to, to this one. And, and the biggest thing with this one is that this is, this is absolutely kind of on the tip of the radar right now. Um, and these conversations are, are actively happening with the ministry around early draw. Um, I don't have anything concrete to to pass along right now because nothing has yet been confirmed. Um, but it's it's the the conversations are absolutely happening, and we, we'd of course love to love to see that. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, Greg, over to your question. Thanks. So. Uh, I'm uh, in Terrace, and so our Coast Mountain PCN uh, is sharing a, a border with the uh, FNPCI in Hazleton. And I'm, I'm just wondering if there's somebody at our CSC level that is uh, from Hazleton whose specific role is to interact with the CSC because I'm not sure about that 
and I sit on the CSC, so I think I should know about that, probably. And then uh, secondly, the whole business, uh, and this might be getting way too granular for this discussion, but that whole attachment gap business uh, calculation can be difficult if there's a lot of traditional movement of patients into and out of an FNPCI uh, to adjacent PCNs and, and how that all gets sorted out. So two questions. Thanks, Greg. That's it's great to hear. There's some familiarity with the uh, with the FNPCI already, and and that some of you have some experience, sort of, at least knowing that there's there's something going on nearby you. So uh, thanks for that. I'll start with your second question first, um, and. Perhaps it was maybe less of a question than, than just an acknowledgement that it does get really complicated with, with, with attachment gap calculation. Um, and, and I would say that the it's primarily the ministry and the and the regional teams that sort of have those conversations on a case-by-case -case basis as um, sort of those preliminary analysis reports are, are, are first done, which is sort of the, the the very early part of the engagement process with the communities who are who are doing the planning. And then after that preliminary analysis report and sort of initial attachment gap calculations, things are, are looked at um, again a little bit further down the road. And, and those calculations are sort of more confirmed as they get into the surface planning stage. Um, so I, I think I probably don't have anything more than that super useful to, to share at this, um, at this particular level. Um, in terms of connection between CSC and and um, and the FNPCC I think it's a I think it's a working group in in that area um, I don't know Tatiana maybe you've got a suggestion but my my feeling would be that the best connection would be um, to chat with with Trish Howard who's the the regional primary care project manager um, do you have any thoughts about that Tatiana? I thought the exact same thing. That would be the best thing to do, to reach out to your FNHA, to your regional FNHA um, primary care contact. Um, so either Trish or Paul, I would say. Um, and they can, um, they can connect back and suggest the best ways to make that connection. Greg, do you have Trish's um, contact information? Yeah, actually, I, I do. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, maybe Trish is the... Uh, CSC rep for the hey, Greg. for the FNPCI and somebody else is chatting with me there right now. Hey, it's Jamie McKean from Hazleton. How's it going? Ah, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> um, just thought I'd I'd share our experience with this if it's okay if there's space. Um, Please. We've been in contact with the uh, Get Sun What's Button Primary Care Initiative. Um, not super regularly, but as regularly as everybody's schedules have allowed during COVID. And um, one of the things that we're also trying to do is trying to engage on the level of a CSC. And um, one of our goals with the Visions has been to bring a CSC to our community and engage um, our local um, community partners as tripartite chair. Um, it has... Um, been moving a little bit at the speed of relationships i think as was mentioned in the previous um um breakout which i thought was i understand is the fnha community representative for the pacific northwest as a whole but that doesn't seem to resonate with our local communities so in hazelton for the time being we've mostly been going through trish howard and paul coppard who have been um excellent help with um the FNPCI and, and Paul, I believe, is the manager, um, and then Trish with her role as the um, with FNHA. Um, Beth has been quite involved with this as well. I'm not sure if Beth, you have further thoughts or. Yeah, I think um, I think just to answer specifically Greg's question. So there are folks like yeah, Trish Howard, absolutely, and uh, Chiro Panessa, who sits on. Pacific Northwest CSC is involved uh, as a partner around that table when called upon. 
Um, the Get Santa Wet'suwet'en Primary Care Initiative Working Group is made up of the health directors for the region, and so they meet much more frequently, and then at times call in partners. So the uh, Pacific Northwest Division is called to that table, as is the Hazelton Chapter of Rural and Remote um, and local health authorities. Hope that helps answer a little bit, a little bit more of that yeah. picture. Hope that helps. If you have any other questions, feel free to connect with us another time or whatnot, Greg. <laughs> I think there's a little bit of the delay. I didn't mean to overspeak you. Um, Greg, did, did the group answer your question to you think as, as well as they could, or do you have any follow-up? Yeah, yeah, that, that helps uh, for sure. Um, one of the things that we're trying to explore a little bit with funding so that we don't step on toes um, by mistake, because I'm sure that's going to happen, uh, is how how do we interact uh, as PCNs with FNPCIs overall with funding that flows to these two different entities that are basically in the, the same region? Hmm. Uh, that's a, a good follow-up question. Um, Tatiana or Fiona, would you like to jump on that? And then uh, next question goes to Bev. Just confirming, so, so the question was just sort of, there's there's two buckets of funding flowing to sort of two different things being planned in the same region. How does how does that sort of work? Is that kind of the basic of the question? Yeah, because there's, you know, there's some similarly shared services. And, and so if there's two buckets of funding, how does it work for those those services that might be shared between different communities. I'm just trying to think of I um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that initially, Tatiana. I think my knowledge might not be specific enough to kind of dig into that one. I can share some thoughts on that. Um, I would say the idea is to try to uh, make the best use of uh, those resources, even though they're coming from um, different pockets of funding. Um, the FMPCI funding, like we, ex we explained through the presentation, um, it's meant to go to a primary care center that's First Nations led. So in that sense, um, the needs uh, and um, desires, I guess, expressed by First Nations communities will be heavily taken into account um, for that specific primary care center. But that, of course, doesn't mean that the services provided in the primary care center um, will only be available to First Nations. Um, actually, uh, we do have, in a way, one of the requirements is that um, the communities explain how services are going to be available to the wider community because um, like Fiona explained, we're looking for this primary care centers to be part of the broader primary care system. So again, I guess that's that's why it would be quite important to um, have those conversations once there's a bit of a service plan or a draft service plan in place, to have those conversations with the CSC so that maybe um, there is, for example, maybe there is a mental health professional that's funded for the FMPCI and that the larger community can use. So then maybe CSC resources can go towards something else, right? So um, I guess that's the conversation that would need to be to be had and why that that partnership is important. I I hope I, I help to answer your question somewhat, Greg. Right? Thanks, Tatiana. Uh, Bev, over to you for the next question. Can I just add one more thing um, into the into that last response as well? Um, and and the the other thing I was going to add is that FNHA is actually directly funding some of these resources as well. So it's not just funding coming from the ministry; um, it's also funding coming from FNHA. And there is a heavy emphasis on being able to fund um, things like traditional healing and elders and um, cultural supports too. So not all of the funding is is coming from the ministry from the for the FNPCR. Thank you, Fiona. Um, all right, Bev, and then Will Hope. 
Hi. Um, just a point of clarification. So when when I asked the last question, um, you said that there was work happening behind the scenes. So are they working on um, a PCI for Lillooet specifically or, or Lytton or if those conversations happen? Because I think in your presentation, you said there'd be 15 sites. And so are those predetermined around the province or are those um, first come first serve, so to speak? Thanks, Bev. That's a great question. Um, some of them are still to be determined, and actually two of them for the, so it's it's roughly going to be three per region um, across the province. Um, the only one that has been uh, confirmed at this point in the interior is the Williams Lake Wellness Centre, which is actually set to be the next one um, that will open um, okay. probably early next year. Um, and the other two for the interior have yet to be determined. And right now, Geraldine Minosa is the acting primary care manager and Fatima El Rubai is the um, primary care project manager for the interior region. Okay, great. Um, and one more um, thing. So um, with we've done an expression of interest or well, the expression of interest went in, but um, we, we've been looking at early draw money for specifically for um, the smaller rural areas for, for Lillooet, Lytton, uh, Ashcroft and Merritt, um, specifically around APNs. And so we're, we're putting that proposal into the ministry. So would that be something that they might look at sort of sh sharing between program so to speak like how would that sort of work in the end so if you um you know say a pci was going in and, and aboriginal patient navigators were, were being hired through the primary care initiative how do they sort of i guess determine how they're going to make that work it might be just that might be a question that's sort of futuristic and not really able to be defined at this point in time yeah, thanks, Bev. I, I think it's a, a great question. And um, with a question like that, I, I would say it, it would be a conversation that happens between the, the PCI and the local um, PCN and the resources. And, and again, just emphasizing that the absolute goal is to, you know, sort of once the, the, the PCI services that First Nations communities want at the PCI have been determined, the, the intention is absolutely to connect those services with um, with the local PCN. So I, I think it would be an important conversation to have if there's APNs working in the area, how they're gonna connect in um, with the site and work with, with, you know, sort of the clinicians there and the clients there um, and how that connects into the greater services in the area. Cause that's, that's certainly the goal. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If I, if I can just chip in here, um, just, I'm not sure if this is where your question was going bad, but. Um, if it's regarding funding that would potentially be available for um, APNs, I'm not 100% sure that that's something that could be funded through the FMBCIs. Um, there is a list of positions, so the ministry has been quite specific with the list of positions that can be funded um, through Ministry of Health funding, and like Fiona explained, FNHA um, has a bit of a similar list that, um, of positions that are more targeted towards traditional health and, and healing. Um, FNHA has tried to be as flexible as possible with that, but I guess if um, APNs were identified as a need, that's a conversation that would need to be had to see if um, FMPCI funds could be used to cover that. Great, thank, thank you. Fiona and Tatiana. Uh, we'll turn over to Dr. Wilho, then uh, Greg Linton, and then Sheena Raffel. Hi, yeah, Will Ho here calling from Pemberton uh, from the unceded territories of Lillooet and Statlam Nation. Um, this is just a quick one, just to clarify, you mentioned before Tatiana that, so the FNPCC, so the First Nations Primary Care Centres, just confirm that they will not be exclusively for First Nations patients only, is that correct? That is correct, yes. The idea is that um, they will be open to the larger community and non-First Nations patients as well. Um, of course, given the orientation of the primary care centers that they will incorporate um, First Nations uh, ways of healing and traditional knowledge, um, I guess it is to be expected that um, a majority of patients will be First Nations, but it's not exclusively for um, First Nations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Greg Linton, back to you. I think it would be fair to say that amongst uh, some First Nations 
communities in the Pacific Northwest, there's a feeling of what about us when it comes to the selection of FN PCIs. And specifically then there are uh, indigenous communities in current PCNs who potentially if they had their druthers would be organized as FN PCIs as well. And so my question to you is how likely is it that the current 15 FN PCIs are going to remain at 15? And uh, politically, are we going to see more of these being created in the not too distant future? And I guess my, my comment would be uh, that I think that would have a real impact on how PCN planning goes in the future in, in those areas that might have more created, more FNPCIs created, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Greg. Let Tatiana uh, talk to this one as well, but um, I, I think it's a, a great point. I, at this point, we, 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 we just have the sort of up to 15, um, and I think the intention is to sort of see how, see how this rolls out. We would, of course, love to see more um, in terms of how that will um, impact PCN planning. It, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, it's all sort of happening in tandem, and it's, it's challenging sometimes, and it's, it's, it's complex when you know sort of th this is happening in one area. It, if, if it continues ha to happen, it, it's going to impact more down the road as we're looking um, sort of towards the future in, in terms of primary care transformation. All of these are going to impact one another, and it's, it's hard to say when we don't have conf confirmation sort of moving forward just how... Um, how things are going to look in another 10 years, I guess, or even in another five years. Um, it's not, not too much of an answer. I think we'd certainly love to see um, more, more FNP, um, FNPCCs out there, but, but right now at this point in time, it's, it's the 15 that we have and that's our focus until 2024. I don't know if Tatiana's got anything to, to add to that or not. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for your question, Greg. And I would like to add from a regional perspective that I think all regions have um, had um, some First Nations communities that were not, um, in a way, very happy uh, with the selection of sites because it's at the regional level, it's not very many, unfortunately, right? It's three um, that had to be selected. Um, I can share from the Vancouver Coastal perspective that that selection was done um, through um, one of our uh, governance bodies, which we call the regional table. Um, basically, First Nations leadership from our region that um, selected and approved the chosen three nations, um, three First Nations primary care centers. Um, and that was done largely based on the capacity of the different organizations to grow and to assume the, um, the quite significant amount of work that will come with creating a new primary care center, right? And then as well with the need, of course, on the ground. Um, but yes, I totally hear and understand that there is the need for um, additional, ideally, hopefully additional First Nations-led primary care centers. And like Fiona mentioned, we're hopeful that um, we can show uh, through this first round of 15 that this is um, something worth investing in and that um, we can get additional funding for more primary care centers in the future. Thanks, Fiona and Tatiana. Uh, Sheena, you've had your hand up. What's your question? Um, I just wonder who is uh, holding the contracts for the service providers? Because as I understand it, FNHA doesn't hold service provider contracts in these um, centers. And then if, if um, you're creating attachment at these FNPCCs. Um, does that take away from the funding in other PCNs? Thanks, Sheena. Great question. And uh, 
I'll, I'll take a, a first stab, Tatiana, if, if, if you can jump in afterwards as well. Um, so the, the question was about funding and taking away from other PCNs and then service contract providers. Um, so I, I can definitely um, share that um, our medical director for primary care, Dr. Terry Aldred, um, is in the process of standing up a Department of Medical Affairs at FNHA, and the intention is absolutely to be able to hold service contracts um, for, for GPs at FNHA. Um, hopefully in the, fairly, in the fairly near future, I don't have a, a, an absolute um, date for you, but that is certainly what we're, what we're working towards. Um, we can hold um, contracts for other providers through our procurement department. Um, in terms of, so, so that's just sort of a little bit about um, sort of where FNHA is at right now in terms of capabilities. Um, in terms of site to site decisions that are being made right now, some of the sites are deciding that, um, you know, they, they might partner with a, a regional health authority or they might partner with another First Nations health organization in the area if their site is not um, capable at that time of, of holding a service contract. Um, I think we need to be clear too that, that, that FNHA is, is not going to be the business entity for every single one of these um, 50, up to 15 sites. Um, so the business entity could be um, a regional health authority if that's what the community dis communities decide. They might stand up their own um, new not-for-profit uh, society um, and, and, and sort of work under that. They might join into an existing not-for-profit society and, and, and the site might be stood up under that. So it's, it's, it's going to vary quite a bit um, from, from site to site, depending on um, who's nearby, what relationships are like uh, with, with regional health authorities and other health, uh, First Nations Health Service organizations. Um, some of the sites might partner with FNHA um, in order for, for us to take on um, some of that sort of contract management or, or employment. Um, but there, there are there, there's sort of variable options um, that many of which are, are being explored at this point in time. Um, the second question was funding for PCNs. And uh, so as I, as I think I mentioned, the, the conversations for both um, FMPCI and the FMPCC sites and the PCNs um, are, are happening with, in collaboration with the, the ministry um, primary care teams. And those, attachment discussions absolutely need to happen uh, in collaboration. So um, there, there, there are some areas where the PCN is in a more advanced state of planning than an FNPCI and, and vice versa. And as that planning advances for, for different sites and different PCNs, those conversations just, just need to keep happening. Um, again, it's going to look a little bit different from, from site to site, but um, I, I don't know how it happens in terms of adjustments made down the road. Um, but I know that there, there's sort of a strong effort to keep that conversation open. Um, Tatiana, I don't know if you've got anything to add from that, from your experience. Mm -hmm. I can add a couple of things. So um, regarding uh, contracts for medical providers, in our case, we do have Vancouver Coastal Health that's um, holding some of the contracts for our FMPCIs. Um, so that's really great that they are supporting us with that piece. Um, as Fiona mentioned, FNHA is working on their medical affairs office, but until then it's really great that we can count with the support of Vancouver Coastal Health for that. Um, and then regarding um, patient attachment and FMPCIs and PCNs, I would say that um, by their very nature, FMPCIs are targeting populations that face quite severe barriers to um, access healthcare and that have quite some problems with regards to the social determinants of health. So, because it's following a very specific model, right? Um, so if you take a look at Luma, for example, um, they have quite a significant wait list, um, even for there in East Vancouver. So technically that means that um, patients could go see any medical provider in East Vancouver, but um, if they, they choose they want to go to Luma for several, several different reasons, right? So I think um, that's something to take into account there as well. Um, and likewise for the other FMPCI sites, I, I think that um, what they aim to, to address is um, a spe very specific um, barriers to access healthcare that um, have been 
historically um, faced by First Nations people. Thank you, Fiona and Tatiana. Um, I just want to acknowledge you're getting a lot of really technical funding questions that are specific. And I just want to say you're handling those very well um, uh, for, yeah, the, for the other sessions. I think the other presenters got off easy, but you guys are <laughs> really earning that. Um, okay, is there anybody else on the session that has either a super technical, no, I'm just kidding. Um, any type of question or reflection about uh, Fiona and Tatiana's presentation or anything that you want to share about your experiences being in a community where there is a First Nation primary care, um, First Nation led primary care initiative or center, um, any reflections that people want to share? Uh, Beth, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, this has just been an awesome conversation. I think Fiona and Tatiana, we could probably put you in a room for about two to three hours and just keep firing questions at you. Um, and it's been really enlightening. Um, yeah, just to kind of have, hear other people asking these questions that have been percolating for a while in Hazleton. And at the same time, we've also, and when I say we, I say myself, who's been participating in the Get Sound What Soot and Primary Care Initiative when asked as sort of um, a practice support coach or health authority partner, and then now more sort of newly in as like a divisions chapter coordinator role. And um, there's a lot of stuff that we're just sort of sitting with, like we don't have all the answers and this isn't our initiative and we're, we get to go in and find out what's happening um, when we're invited and, and get to give input um, when we're asked for input. Um, and I know just speaking personally for me, that has been hugely challenging. I love knowing what's going on. I love sharing my opinion. Um, so it's just, it's just been a really interesting and different sort of thing to be involved with. Um, and and um, I, I, I think that the, the, the points of sharing information between and across uh, um, PCIs and, or sorry, First Nations led PCIs and PCNs is, is also and still really important. And um, yeah, there's a lot of different sort of tools that we need to do that and, and time to give to it. So not really a question, just kind of a comment and a thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Beth. Anybody else have any remarks that they want to share with the group or reflections from our conversation today? I'll just share one more thing if, if, that's, if that's okay. Um, and thanks, thanks so much, Beth, for, for sharing your, your reflections. Um, I also just wanted to say too, um, it's not exactly a disclaimer, but a lot of the information um, that we shared today is, is sort of information we know to the best of our knowledge right now. Um, it is a super steep learning curve. And any of you who may have been involved in sort of the, the planning of the very first PCNs and stuff will probably remember, like it was just, you know, you're sort of, you're learning as you go along. As, as you're implementing, you're also learning and building. And, and that's exactly what we're doing as well. Um, so I, I saw um, in particular Beth's question in the chat about how, you know, the FNPCI and the PCN both come from the same funding pot. Well, I would have said exactly the same thing um, probably a few months back, but I know, and, and it, it may still be true, but what I've learned, the more I learned, the more I realize I don't know, uh, as, as many of you have probably heard before. And there, there's sort of many different areas that primary care funding gets gets pulled from and sort of funneled through the ministry primary um, care. And it's been really complex to figure out sort of exactly where some of those uh, some of those come from. Um, so I can I can sort of share that from from some of the experiences we've had over the last few months. Um, I think they're really, really important conversations to have and and, and to keep having. Um, but just really wanting to highlight that, you know, it's good to keep asking questions because as we learn more information, the answers might shift um, as we go along as well, as we, as we learn more. And um, yeah, that, so that's, that's sort of what I, what I have to say is just, it's, it's really, it's been amazing learning. It's been such an incredible journey so far. I've been um, working with, with the project sort of on a, on a provincial level since last um, December. And 
just really excited for, for, for what we're sort of um, supporting First Nations to build and looking forward to working with everybody. Well, that's great, Fiona. I think that your comments inspired another question, which is lovely. Um, Will, back to you. Yeah, this is less of a question, but I'd also like to echo what Fiona just said in terms of learning along the way. Like, um, as Tatiana would know, like I'm involved in the CSC, which Little White Nation and the Southern Statlim Health Health Authority uh, Health Society um, is engaged in, and there is a little bit of mystery around that process sometimes, and the way the Ministry of Health makes their decisions. Um, you know, most recently we put in an early draw for a social worker for the area, having engaged with our First Nations partners and it all come in agreement that the need was there and it was something that we would like to proceed with, um, with all in agreement only for the Ministry of Health to then lock that back and, the, and, and, and their reasoning was that they wanted to see that as a part of our PCN or that they were awaiting the FNPCI to come through and seeing if that is asked through the FNPCI. So it's, I don't know, like it's a bit of double handling there and it's a, it was a little bit of a mystery, but we, we will wait to see what falls out of, you know, the, the both um, Little White Nation and the Southern Stat Statlam Health Society's FNPCIs look like as far as where that goes. Um, but I'll also, um, agree with what Beth said in terms of, you know, the communication being really important um, throughout all of the partners as far as knowing where everyone else is at with, with each of the pieces in terms of PCN and the FNPCI. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely um, buoyed by the prospects of what this could bring. I mean, the, our sort of, um, our patient dependency here and the, 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 the area in which we draw from here in Pemberton um, is quite broad and there is a large um, First Nations population here in which we serve. So it, it's gonna be great to see how this has um, hopefully a very positive impact on the way they access um, healthcare and hopefully improve their, um, their health outcomes also in the long term. Great, thank you for that. Um, any reflections based on Will's comments or anything that anybody else would like to share? Just gratitude to Will's comment and um, expressing that um, we also look forward to being at the phase where um, we have a bit of a draft service plan to share um, with our partners in, in the area. And uh, that our hope as well is that, of course, the FNPCI will uh, help to improve um, access for um, those First Nations patients that um, are, well, some of them are currently using the Pemberton Medical Clinic, but then as well to improve um, access to primary health care um, overall for um, the communities in the area. 